All right, so welcome to Math 150. This is lecture 34. So this is the home stretch. What we're going to do today is we're going to do change of variables and then do an application of this Newton's law of gravity. So this is the last homework assignment to hand in is just your know, four problems due on, oh, uh, it's not showing, thank you. So there are you know four problems to do and hand those in for Wednesday's class. I will also give you a video to listen to on Green's theorem in a day. So the main difference between Math 150 and 151 is 151 does Green Gauss Stokes theorem. If you're going on in physics, those are extremely important. So I have a one day version of that uh, that I would like you to just watch that won't be on the exams, but it's just something you should be at least aware of. And then if you are gonna continue in physics, I am happy to talk about that and Wednesday, I will leave to discuss the Green Gal Stokes theorem if people have questions about that, as well as just a general review for the class. All right, so, what we want to do today is we want to talk about how do you derive the change of variable formula in full generality? No, we don't. All right, to do that properly, you would have to really understand a lot of linear algebra, some analysis, and whatnot. We want to just talk about it, you know, generally give a rough sense of what's going on and see how this reduces to things we've seen before. And as always, you know, since this is the last week of the semester, use this as either a springboard for applications or as a way to review material that we've done throughout the semester and see, well, why do we spend so much time in the beginning of the semester looking at all these equations of lines and hyperplanes and all that stuff? Why do we introduce the cross product and determinants and all that stuff? So you know, let's try to see some applications. And so the idea, is we have a change of variable. Maybe we have X as a function of UV and Y as a function of UV. And I wanna integrate over some region R, F of X, Y, DX, DY, to an integral over some region R star of F of X of UV, y of uv du dv. And so the question is, does it go just like this? No, there's something that I have to put in here. I have to put in some function of u and v. And this is basically coming from the fact that dx dy doesn't just go to du dv, there's some kind of rescaling. So for example, We've seen in polar, dx dy goes to what? R d r d theta. And in spherical, dx dy dz, anybody remember what that goes to? So again, we, 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 use, we use rho not r. This is spherical. spherical. I'm not doing cylindrical because cylindrical is just so straightforward from polar. You know, if you can get polar, you can get cylindrical. So what would spherical be? Rho squared. Rho squared. Uh -huh. D theta d phi. We're going to use sine phi because we're mathematicians. And so we're going to have theta coming down from the z. We're going to have phi coming down from the z axis and theta parallel in the xy plane. So it's really important to remember that it's phi, not theta in math speak. If you use theta, it's not wrong so long as you switch the roles of theta and phi. And we wanna figure out how do things transform? Well, we actually saw an easy case earlier. So we did polar, we did spherical, but at the end of the class, we actually did a third one. We did ellipses and we had dx dy went to a, b, du dv. And that was you know, a really nice, simple rescaling. Think of it as changing from meters to feet. And so what's really going on with the change of variables? So let's imagine we have our uv space here and we have our xy space here. And I've got some little box, you know, here's my du, Here's my dv. Instead of du, I could write delta u, delta v. Let me do, let me do deltas instead. You know, we'll, we'll do a small little change. So we'll do delta u, delta v. 
And so this is some point u naught v naught. And this over here would be u naught plus delta u v naught plus delta v. And then over here, and I'm not going to draw things to scale. Here's the point x of u naught v naught comma y of u naught v naught. And then I've got to figure out what are these other four points? Okay. Well, as long as delta u is small and delta v is small, do you think there's going to be a lot of change as we move along the bottom side of the region, the xy space? Do you think the points are going to be close together or far apart if delta u and delta v are small? Close together. So let's try to think how we would approximate. So x of u naught plus delta u v naught, what would that equal? How would the x coordinate change? Well, let's do like a Taylor series in one variable. All right. So what would be the initial term? What would be your first guess? for where x naught at u naught plus delta u should be. I'm sorry? It should be the x, well, not quite u naught. I've got x of u naught plus delta u v naught. What's your first guess, the zero order expansion for where the x coordinate should be? It should just be not, you know, just, Is it just oh. so if I give you a Taylor series, what's the first term with the yeah. zero term in the Taylor series? Not X. It's not U naught V naught. It's close to U naught V naught. It's gotta be something in the XY space. It's X at U naught V naught. Right, my initial guess is I have not moved. So my initial guess is just it's X of U naught V naught. We're just doing the tangent line approximation. Where am I at some later time? I'm where I started. And then the next is I move a little bit. How do I figure out how far I move? I need to know two pieces of information. The elapsed time, what's the elapsed time? Delta what? Delta u, right? I'm just changing the first coordinate. So the elapsed time is delta u. What's my instantaneous speed? Yes, I'm changing x by changing the first coordinate. I need my instantaneous speed. So the time would be delta u. And what's the speed going to be? Not delta v over delta u. The partial derivative of good, the partial derivative of what function? The partial derivative of x with respect to what variable? With respect to u. And at what point do I evaluate this at? So what point would I evaluate this at? It's still u naught v naught. This is how we expand things. So think of it as you know, you know, remember Taylor. You know, f of x is you know f of zero plus you know f prime of zero, you know x minus zero plus dot dot dot. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're just expanding X and changing X ever so slightly. What about the change in Y? What would Y of U naught plus delta U V naught equal? It would just be Y of U naught V naught plus, now it's gonna be DY DU 
at u naught v naught delta u. Okay. So what I can do is I can draw, you know, like a tangent line. And that's gonna be a pretty good approximation for that bottom side. As delta U and delta V get very, very small, the difference is going to be negligible. To first order, that's exactly where my point should be. There's gonna be potentially a second order term, a third order term, a fourth order term. So there could be something involving delta U squared, delta U cubed, delta U to the fourth. If my function is nice, delta U squared is going to be very negligible. If I tell you you've just won a million dollars and I'm depositing it in your bank account later today, are you happy? If anybody here is not, then you are in a very different situation than most of us talk to me after class. The final can be flexible, okay? <laughs> Imagine I tell you, oh my God, there was a mistake. I'm so sorry. It's not a million dollars. There's a thousand dollar bank processing charge. Yeah, exactly. You're like, okay, fine. Yeah, I don't care. I'll pay $2,000. I want to make damn sure the transaction happens, right? That's noise. $1,000, $2,000 out of a million, it's noise. It's not going to be noticeable. It's the same way over here. When delta U and delta V are really, really small, approximating where I am by this is not that bad. So let's call this vector um, P. And so if I look at that vector, if I look at where I end and I subtract where I started, then this is going to essentially be um, dx du comma dy du times delta u. Does everyone agree that that's what that vector would be? What if I went in the other direction? Well, if you do a very similar argument, what do you think the answer should be by symmetry? Instead of dx du dy du delta u, it should be dx dv dy dv delta v, exactly. An entirely similar argument goes where now we hold the other ones fixed. So this, let's call this q, that would be dx dv dy dv delta V. So I'll draw this a little bit bigger on the next page. So again, you know, here is my delta U, delta V. Here's my P, which is dx, du, dy, du, delta u, and here's my q, which is going to be dx dv dy dv delta v. So what is the area in xy space? Can somebody give me a, how would you find the area? I'm sorry? So I could write down an integrate, but approximately, what kind of region is this approximately? Not a square, close. A square would have to be a right angle. It's a parallelogram. So this is a parallelogram. So it's approximately a parallelogram. How do you find the area of a parallelogram if you have two vectors? This is where we're using from the bank all that stuff we put in at the start of the semester. Okay, but okay, so you so but what if, you gotta be careful when you say multiply. Dot product gives you the cosine, right? If I take the dot product, I get the length times the cosine. It's not the dot product. It's the cross product. So the area is going to be p cross q, or it's going to be the determinant. Um, dx du delta u dy du delta u dx dv delta v d 
dy dv delta v. And so if I pull things out, this is going to be dx du, dy du, dx dv, dy dv times delta u delta v. And recall the determinant of a, b, c, d is a, d minus b, c. We have to be a little bit careful. Technically, the cross product involves vectors in three dimensions. If we really want to do the cross product here, what we would have to do is make the third component what? Zero. And then when you take the cross product, you would only get something in the z components. You would get a vector coming out of the plane whose magnitude would be the length of this. Or you can remember our formula, which in the plane, the area is the determinant. If I had something of three variables and a three variable change, then instead of having a determinant of a two by two matrix, what do you think it would be? It would be a determinant of a three by three. So that's where linear algebra becomes very useful. When you now do something like this, you would now say, okay, now we're gonna shift gears, we're gonna do linear algebra and handle this more generally. But you would just have more and more components. And as long as delta u, delta v, delta w, oops, ah, oops sorry, just one second. Hello? Yes? Okay, I'll talk to that at some future right now. Okay. That's just the dentist, my tooth came out, and so I have to deal with getting it fixed today. All right. Um, so the determinant is AB minus BC. It gets harder as you go into more and more dimensions. But really, you would just be adding more and more components. We now have more and more vectors. If I had three variables, I would have a parallelogram. Um, no, parallel pipe, and then just gets higher and higher and higher. It's a little bit harder to visualize, but approximately, if things are very, very small, it will be very well approximated by a parallelogram. The error is going to be insignificant. And so the only thing you have to be careful about is when we're doing the change of variables, we want to make sure that it's a positive number. So if I switch the order, of two vectors, if I do C, D, A, B, that's going to be C, B minus A, D. That's negative A, D minus B, C. So we've got to be careful, which order do we have things? And so when we're trying to figure out how the areas change, it's actually the absolute value of the determinant, not the determinant. So the answer that's going to go in here uh, this is going to be the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian. And that's what we call the matrix of partial derivatives. So let's, let's do an example. What's the simplest non-trivial example you can think of where we know what dx dy should transform to? I'm sorry? What's the simplest example you can think of where we know what dx dy should transform to? But an example with some meat. So what's one of our transformations where we were able to discuss in class what dx dy should become? Polar. So let's do polar. So we have x of r theta is gonna be r cosine theta y of r theta is going to be r sine of theta. So let's calculate dx d theta dy d theta dx dr dy. Uh, let's see. I'll do it the other order. We'll, we'll, we'll do r first and then theta. So we'll do dx dr dy dr dx d theta dy d theta. All right, what's dx dr? What's the root of x with respect to r? Cosine theta. And if we take the root of y, we get sine of theta. 
And if we take the derivative of x with respect to theta, what do we get? Negative r sine theta. And then we get r cosine of theta. And so when we expand it all out, we're going to get r cosine squared theta minus and a minus is a plus r sine squared theta. Oh, well, that's one of the most famous of all change of variance. And now you can see why I chose to do r first and theta second. Because doing it that way, I ended up with something positive and I don't have to worry about the absolute value. And so we would then get you know, dx dy goes to the absolute value of the determinant of the matrix. I'll do it x sub r, y sub r, x sub theta, y sub theta, dr d theta, which is just r dr d theta. As an exercise, do this for spherical. Check and see that when you take the derivatives for spherical, you end up getting the same answer. This is just a good way to make sure you understand what's going on. So this is you know, the 20 minute with a phone interruption introduction to you know, change of variables. You know, the more complicated the change of variable formula is, the more complicated the Jacobian will be. Is that your conversion factor? What's really nice about polar is it's just R, there's no theta dependence. For spherical, it's rho squared sine phi. It depends very nicely on rho, depends very nicely on phi, and doesn't depend at all on theta. And again, as you keep making things more and more complicated, then you get a more and more involved change of variables. One of the big themes you do in linear algebra is you try to choose the coordinate system that is right for a given problem. Have we talked about rotated ellipses in this class? Okay. How many of you vaguely remember doing algebra two at some point and doing conic sections? It's supposed to be in the curriculum or, 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 or in trigonometry. How many of you remember doing conic sections at some point? You know, formulas for ellipses, hyperbolas. Right. If you were doing physics, you must learn these. These come up in classical mechanics. If I give you an ellipse, they often choose things so that A is the semi-major axis, it's the longer one. And you have X over A squared plus Y over B squared equals one. Well, I could be cruel and instead give you an ellipse that's at an angle. And now, if you've done conic sections in high school, you should not know how to handle something like this. And what you do to handle something like this is, you know, initially, you have, whoops, I've got my y axis, my x axis. What you do is you change variables. Here's my u axis, here's my v axis. And now I'll have u over a squared plus v over b squared equals one. And that will be the ellipse in the uv space. And then I just write u as a function of x and y, and I write v as a function of x and y. And it turns out that there's a really nice matrix that does that. It turns out that this is a rotation by theta radians. And there's a nice way to write down what is a rotation matrix that essentially all you're doing is, well, look, if I just rotate my coordinate axes by theta, my coordinate axes now align with the ellipse. And now that they're aligned with the ellipse, I can study what's going on. I can write down the equation very nicely. And then after I do that, I then rotate back and now I've got things back into X and Y. So a lot of linear algebra is about trying to find what is the right coordinate system to use to study a given problem. Okay, any questions on the change of variable up to here? Okay, so what I wanna do for the rest of class today is hopefully finish, but if not, at least start 
you know, a multivariable integral that matters. So we talked a little bit about the Gaussian integral, you know, the normalization for the bell curve, the normal, the Gaussian, why is it one over square root of two pi? It's tied to the gamma function. This is an extremely important function. This really matters. One of the biggest integrals ever done in the history of science is Newton's calculation that you can assume all of the mass of an object is at the center in terms of trying to deal with gravitational issues. What assumptions do we need for this? Well, let's assume that the mass is either uniform or if it's not uniform, it's at least uniform on spherical shells. You know, obviously, if you have an object where the mass is not uniform, imagine almost all the mass is at the North Pole and there's very little mass anywhere else. Well, if you had a situation like that, then I don't think it would be the same as all the mass being at the center because essentially all the mass is at the North Pole. So we'll assume that the mass of the object is uniform. And we want to try to calculate you know, what is the force on some object. So we need a lot of notation. So we will start off So here's our object. Anybody know why I'm choosing green? The Earth. Okay. If I chose yellow, I'd be thinking of the sun. I, so here is my Earth. I've got my object all the way up here. And let's say that that's little r, because that's the formula we often use in physics, you know, your r units from the center. So I need something else for the radius of the Earth. I'll call the radius of the Earth capital R. And we'll assume the density is one. Why am I saying, why am I writing assume the density is one rather than writing the standard symbol for density? Does anybody know what letter you normally use for density? Rho. Well, I don't want to write down rho equals one because we want to keep rho for spherical coordinates. So what is the mass? It would just be four thirds pi r cubed. So that would be the mass. So it's very easy to figure out what is the force if all the mass is at the center, right? So, and we'll say that the mass here is M. So all mass at center, it would be G four thirds pi R cubed times m divided by r squared. So is everybody comfortable? Newton's law of gravity is the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance separating them. Okay. Now, Newton's law of gravity says between any two points, there is a force of attraction. And that force is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the separation. And the direction of the force is along the line connecting them. So by symmetry, we know all the points on the sphere are gonna balance out with other parts of the sphere so that the only force is gonna be a net down. If I have something on the right, it's balanced with something on the left. So I only have to figure out at every moment in time, what is the Z component? So let's try to draw this. Um, So here's R, um, except rather than doing R, let's assume I'm at some point inside the sphere of radius rho. And for spherical coordinates, what's the range of rho? Not zero to pi, not for rho. B is zero to pi. Where does rho go for, for the sphere? So 
So we're, we're going to the sphere of radius capital R. What's the range for rho? Zero to R. So we have zero less than equal to rho less than equal to R. And we already said the range of phi is from zero to pi. So zero less than equal to phi less than equal to pi, and then zero less than equal to theta less than equal to two pi. So imagine we've come down phi radians. So we've got my row here, my row here. We've come down phi radians. And I can look at all the points that are on the corresponding circle. All of them will have the same net direction down. Do we agree on that? They'll have different side components, but they'll all have the same direction down. If you want to think about it, just keep spinning the globe. Each point on that circle is going to have the same Z component down, but they will have different left and right components or front and back components. I don't care about those because I know those will all cancel. I only care about what's coming down. Okay, so we need to figure out what is the force. So to figure out the force, I've got to figure out um, how far away am I? And I have to figure out what's the infinitesimal volume element where I am. And so what do you think the infinitesimal volume element would be around here? So we could do things in Cartesian coordinates, dx, dy, dc. What would that be in spherical coordinates? So it should be rho squared sine phi, what else? If I want a small little block over there. Instead of dx dy dz, it should be d rho d. Yep. In, in some order for the two angles, it doesn't really matter. All right, so that should be my little volume element. Uh, so that should be my volume element. What would be the mass of that volume element? Well, if I integrate this over the whole sphere, what should I get? I should get four thirds pi big R cubed, right? Because if I just integrate one dx dy dz over the whole sphere, I just get the volume of the sphere. This is how things transform. This is my infinitesimal mass unit. Infinitesimal mass is the following. And so all I need now is the distance. So we are running out of letters of the alphabet. We've used capital R, we've used lowercase r, we've used capital rho. What can we use for distance? We could use what? We could use D. The only reason not to use D is what? It's, you could confuse it for derivatives. I'm happy to use D if people are comfortable with D. Sometimes people use S. Do people have any preference? S will use S. L is another possibility for length. And so I put little things over there to try to remind it that it's not a five. Okay, does anybody know how to calculate S with the information that we have. And it is something else that we have in the bank earlier in the semester. I'll redraw it on the next page. So here's S. 
here is phi, here is rho, here is r. How do we get s? It's a triangle, so what do we use? So Pythagoras works only if it's a right triangle, so you're close. I'm sorry? It's, a, it's, a, it's almost surely not gonna be right. You could, but we actually have something in the bank for this. It's the generalization of Pythagoras. Those elements are involved. What's the rule called? Law of cosines. So if we use the law of cosines, we get S squared is R squared plus rho squared, the other two sides minus two R rho cosine of the angle in between, which is phi. Okay, so now we have our integral. First of all, are you happy or sad that we have an S squared? You know, we have an S squared and not an S. Is this good or bad? Why is this good? I'm sorry? Well, for this problem, do we want an S or do we want an S squared? The force is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. It's S squared that we want. So we're not gonna to have to take a square root. So we're gonna have an infinitesimal volume element, which is rho squared sine of phi d rho d phi d theta. And then we divide by S squared, which is gonna be R squared plus rho squared minus two R rho. And then Newton, of course, says it's just G uh, and little m. So that's what we need to calculate. Rho goes from zero to R, phi goes from zero to pi, theta goes from zero to two pi. Which integral is the easiest one to do? Which integral is the easiest one to do? The rho integral, the phi integral, or the theta integral? Oops, two rho cosine phi. The theta integral, what's the theta integral? Not one. Well, it's what's the theta integral going to give us? That times theta, and then we're integrating from theta goes from zero to two pi. So when you do the theta integral, what do you get? That times two pi, does everybody agree? We just get two pi when we do the theta integral. We can split up and do the theta integral first, None of this depends on theta, so we just get a two pi. So this is going to be two pi gm. And now, which do you want to do first, the rho integral or the phi integral? You want to do the rho integral first? So you would have to integrate rho squared over r squared plus rho squared minus two r rho cosine. You could do this. Um, you know, there are games you could play. It would involve potentially partial fractions, but there are games you could play. What about the phi integral? Does the phi integral look nice? So what do you think? Can anybody think of how we might do the phi integral? So 
have integral rho goes from zero to r, phi goes from zero to two pi. I have a bit of rho squared here. Uh, well, I'll keep the rho squared. Rho, rho squared sine of phi d phi over r squared plus rho squared minus two r rho cosine phi d rho. So we wanna to try to evaluate this integral. Oh, sorry, it feels from zero to pi, thank you. So what integration techniques do we have that might handle something like this? This is now a calc two problem. So one could be integration by parts. So what would your two functions be? So for integration by parts, you normally write it as a product of two things. We have a quotient. It's a good thing to try. What other techniques do we have? U substitution. So the bottom involves the sine of phi. So the bottom involves the cosine of phi, the numerator involves the sine of phi. Can you see any good choices for u? So if, well, so we take u equals sine of phi, then du would be, it would involve a cosine of phi, but that's all amalgamated down below. So we take u to be cosine of phi, we could do this. I think there might even be something better. Maybe something even better than that. Maybe even better than that. I might just take the whole denominator. Take the whole denominator, then the numerator is essentially the derivative of the denominator. So let's try u equals r squared plus rho squared minus two r rho cosine phi. Then du would be, derivative of cosine is negative sine. So it would just become two r rho sine of phi d phi. So rho, I'm sorry. So rho sine of phi d phi would be one over two r du. Well, the one over two r is not a problem because two r is a fixed constant. Now we have to figure out what the ranges are. Phi goes from zero to pi. What does u go from? When phi is zero, what's the cosine of zero? So we get r squared plus rho squared minus two r rho. So what would you be when phi is zero? So r squared plus rho squared minus two r rho. How does that simplify? <coughs> So we have, let me write it different. So we have r squared plus rho squared minus two r rho. So in terms of trying to simplify this, what if I wrote it as r squared minus two r rho plus rho squared? Does that make it a little bit easier to see what it is? So what would that be? That's just r minus rho. And what do you think you get when you take uh, phi equals pi? You would then get r squared plus rho squared plus two r rho. So you just get r plus rho. 
So if you do a little bit of algebra, that's going to be the ranges. So this integral is going to be the same as the integral u goes from r minus rho to r plus rho. Uh, we have rho squared. I need one of the rows to be part of the rho sine phi d phi. So I'm going to get a rho over 2r. Then I'm going to get a du. And then in the bottom, I just get a u. So this should just be rho over 2r natural log of, if I've done everything correctly, r plus rho over r minus rho. Okay. And now we need to integrate from zero to r of, I think we had a two pi g outside, two pi g m. Um, rho over two r, natural log of r plus rho over r minus rho d rho. And so we've now reduced this to a one dimensional integral. But this looks like a, you know, a bit of a painful, you know, we've got this natural log of r plus rho over r minus rho. You know, does this have a nice antiderivative? Do we perhaps split the log into two different pieces? You know, the log of r plus rho minus the log of r minus rho. And then do we maybe try to integrate by parts? So you know, for extra credit, you know, see if you can finish this integral out. The point is we've reduced this down to one dimensional calculations. I, I believe I've done this without making a mistake. I will not promise that there is a chance I might've made an error somewhere, but this is essentially how you go through and do it. You can also do it directly in X, Y, Z coordinates and just do it with the DX, DY, DZ. You know, the question becomes which integrals are easier at the end of the day? When we saw the phi integral at first, did the phi integral look bad? I mean, I think the phi integral initially looked bad, but like so many things in mathematics, once somebody says, hey, look at it this way, then it's not so bad. The difficulty is how do you find the right way to look at things? You know, it's not immediately clear what's the right way. And then eventually you might notice, oh wait, I've got a sine and a cosine. Each is essentially the derivative of the other up to a sine. So maybe if I do a u substitution, I can make this nice. And I can do the phi integral without any trouble. But now I'm stuck with you know, doing this rho integral. And is this an easy rho integral to do? Um, it turns out there is a nice antiderivative for the natural log function. The antiderivative of the natural log of x is x natural log of x minus x. So there is something like that, but I've got rho times that. So you know, is this going to be easy or hard? You know, there's lots of different tricks you could do. I could try to do a Taylor series expansion of maybe r plus rho over r minus. There's lots of things you can do. Um, you could also maybe even try to look at the limit as, uh, I, I don't know. you could try looking at limit as your know, r goes to infinity then you know, the sphere size really shouldn't matter. This should hopefully you know, reduce to what we've already seen as a nice just you know, sanity check. But maybe this is not the best way to do it. Maybe it's better to do this problem in Cartesian coordinates and then just say, well, look, instead of um, you know, using the spherical coordinates, I know that on any circle, I can just calculate what's the mass of a ring or maybe play games like that in terms of just how I'm doing my dx dy. And maybe Z goes from and just you're know, playing it like that. So whenever you have something that's beginning to look painful like this, it's not a bad idea to, if you can't do the integral easily, stop, go back to the beginning, see if another way is better. If so, do that. If not, come back and see if you can finish this. All right, so this is a good place to stop. Uh, the class on Wednesday will just be a review class. So any